Yeah, can, can you explain a little bit of what happened? So uh, his foreign policy in his first week is really weird. I'd almost describe it as allergic. So um, uh, uh, before I jump into that, I wanted to quickly say uh, it seems like Biden in a weird way is following Trump's trajectory in his first 100 days in that uh, Trump could have worked really hard. And I know many thinkers have brought this up. Trump could have worked really hard in his first 100 days on passing a robust infrastructure bill uh, that would have supported and positively impacted the infrastructure in every district of the nation and um, successfully pass that. And if he succeeded at doing that in his first 100 days, forcing the the Republican and Democrat legislators to go along with a robust infrastructure bill, the rest of his presidency would have been overshadowed by that positive impact, would have been overlooked by that positive infrastructure bill. And then he could have thrown all the red meat to the base that he wanted to in the culture war. and. Uh, he failed in doing that by jumping straight into the culture war with enacting the Muslim ban in his first week, the travel ban, and uh, enacting other culturally provocative initiatives in his first 100 days. Uh, Biden seems to be doing the same thing. Instead of a very robust stimulus package and pair it with a very robust infrastructure package, he's kind of sort of, you know, uh, wiggling and moving around on that but he's more focused on an immigration uh, effort, a uh, comprehensive immigration bill, which is great stuff. We need to address it, but the culture war stuff uh, isn't what we should be focused on right now, right at this particular moment. Right, but what about uh, the troops a in raging Syria? pandemic? Huh? Uh, what about the troops in Syria? What, what, what happened there? Yeah, so, um, so back, I think it was uh, 2019, I want to say, Trump moved troops from a certain area in Syria, the oil fields in northeastern Syria, uh, and folks uh, thought it was uh, an effort to bolster Rajab Tayyip Erdogan's efforts against the YPG, which is an extension of the PKK, which is a Kurdish uh, resistance group against the Turkish government. They have communist leanings. Um, so people think that Trump did that to um, to support Erdogan's efforts against the Kurdish resistance fighters and in turn giving uh, the Syrian government, giving Bashar al-Assad a win and giving Rajab Tayyip Erdogan a win um, or potentially giving Rajab Tayyip Erdogan a win while simultaneously harming Bashar al-Assad or whatever contextual results analysts want to add to whatever happened uh, at that time. So what Biden had done here in his first week is return those troops to protect the oil over there um, and to uh, have feet or foot on the ground against the, against the Assad regime uh, and potentially uh, we'll see if this happens in the future, bolster support for the YPG, the Kurdish resistance movements fighting against Bashar al-Assad uh, Bashar al-Assad in Syria. So um, uh, to summarize that in short, uh, Biden, uh, Biden uh, increased uh, troop reinforcements in Syria to protect the oil. Basically, that's the, the loud part that Trump said out loud uh, during his administration. Uh, that Biden is continually doing, uh, continuing to do, uh, but say quietly. So he's, he's moving in troops that uh, I believe Trump moved out. Doesn't matter why or for whom, but the point of the matter is Trump moved those troops out. And there is rumblings of uh, Biden potentially increasing or reinforcing American troop presence in Iraq as well. Um, we will have to see if, if that actually takes place, that actually materializes, but troop increases in Syria did materialize. In fact, last Friday, I think, is when they were officially asked to go out there, when they were officially well, they were deployed. I think it's, it, maybe it was Thursday. It was very early in his administration. Um, I think it was, what, 200 troops 
Uh, but the point yeah. of the matter is he could make this happen like that uh, on his first day in office, first full day in an office. Just like that. Yeah. Exactly. Just like that. And, and you know, they say that, um, you know, Trump was doing this and it's such a bad thing because it's going to cause more war if he pulls troops out. No, uh, troops out. No, you dummies. It won't. And Trump didn't move them out of Syria and then out of the, uh, out of the Middle East. No, he moved them to southern parts of Syria from the north and other western parts of, of Iraq. Um, exactly. And, and he and, moved some of the troops in Iraq that he drew down late in 2020 mm -hmm. to places like Somalia and Djibouti and other parts of the Middle East exactly. and the Horn of Africa. So and it's right. not like he brought the troops home like he promised. So Trump did not fulfill on those promises either. He just, either. He just moved the troops around. He just moved them around to different places. Right. And he also, you know, I think, how do I put this? He had vehicles, trucks, tanks, armored vehicles, and planes in the air, right? Can you explain about that? Yes. So uh, uh, Trump did move in a whole bunch of armored trucks and different types of planes into B-52s into the Persian Gulf to circle Iran and threaten Iran and let Iran know that, in fact, the United States is here to stay and we'll be right on your doorstep at any given moment. We're right here at the Strait of Hormuz. Um, and so... Uh, I think upon the upon the requests of uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, and Israel. And it's interesting to see this is a positive development, I suppose, of the Biden administration, if there is such a thing. He has paused, and I don't know why he hasn't just permanently halted and canceled, but rather he has paused uh, arms sales to the United Arab Emirates. And correct me if I'm wrong, I think he also paused... Uh, future arms sales to Saudi Arabia as well. Uh, granted, he hasn't halted. He just paused, emphasized the word pause. Yeah, I, yeah, he paused it, but I think it doesn't have to do with contract pay. It might, it might. The, the point of the matter is these arms sales or any future arms sales should not happen. Right, he put uh, a because pause. it's just it's just going to be provocative uh, to Iran, and it's not going to uh, advance any diplomatic efforts. Um, we tried we tried Trump's maximum pressure campaign that didn't bring Iran to the negotiating table to the negotiations table. The only thing that brought Iran to the negotiations table was. And for as many flaws as Barack Obama had, it was his successful JCPOA uh, back in 2015, 2016 that he had done with Russia, China, France, uh, Germany, and so on. Right. And the thing is, is that Biden wants to bring that back, but he's also putting more troops, more vehicles, right? More stipulations, but he's also putting more troops, more um, cars, more air supply into Syria. Yeah, fight, uh, uh, fighting jets and flyers and stuff like that, uh, all the air uh, machinery. And uh, if he does increase the, if he if he does increase the troop presence in Iraq, he is also telling Iran, "Hey, we're still at your doorstep." So that's still provocative, nonetheless. Definitely, for sure. Um, you know, and and if you look, if you look at a, he appointed, I think his name is Robert Malley. Correct me if I'm wrong. I think so. As the as as the Biden administration envoy to Iran, uh, envoy to Iran, uh, who was instrumental in making the JCPOA a reality, alongside uh, John Kerry and others. Uh, but the point of the matter is now they're approaching it and saying, oh, we're in a new era, so we might need to add new stipulations. Maybe you can't have intercontinental ballistic missiles. Maybe you can't have other forms of missiles. And Iran would be, Iran would be uh, mad, insane, and frankly stupid to comply with something like that. They cannot because 
Turkey has missiles, Saudi Arabia has missiles, Egypt has missiles, Israel has missiles, the United Arab Emirates has missiles, Syria, I believe, has missiles. Mm -hmm. So it is only in Iran's defense and protection, it is only in Iran's defense and protection that they have missiles as well. So the Biden administration cannot and should not ask Iran to get rid of their missiles from their arsenal. It's like Uh, I said in that video. Not an option. Right, it's like I don't know if you uh, were able to watch it, um, but I did a video on Iran, the nuclear deal, and I said, mm-hmm. "Look, you had the hardliners, the Ayatollah, the Revolutionary Guard, Tel Hassan Rouhani, say, saying, don't get into this deal with the devil. They're gonna pull the hell out. They're gonna pull the freak out. We're right. Don't do it.' And now that Trump pulled out, they were emboldened. The hard hardliners, the right wing of Iraq, the Republicans of Iraq, and they they don't want him to get back into the deal. And why would he? Now, the reason why he would is because of economic sanctions that are on Iran. He needs those lifted. He needs to create jobs in his economy. He needs to fix it. But again, you're asking, hey, get out of this deal or get into this deal and also give up this, this, and that, and your, your, your nuclear energy, your, your, your plutonium, your uranium, your whatever you use to make, and your missiles. It's not like Iran was the one not following the deal and pulling out of the deal. No, we're the ones who pulled out. We don't have victim uh, power now. We don't. We can't play the victim card. We pulled out. So, uh, again, um, Biden... The only, a- way, the only way we can re-enter this deal is if we re-enter it on the terms that it was originally established upon uh, uh, under the Obama administration. And we pick up where we left off and Iran reverses any enriching that happened once the United States pulled out of the deal. And look, if we want to, because the U.S. is talking about going after Iran for enriching after we pulled out, enriching uranium after we pulled out of the deal, we cannot go after them because we pulled nope. out of the deal. It's like, it's like saying, okay, um, I, I don't want to, I, I, I don't know if how many of your audience are younger don't want to be too vulgar, but uh, let's say um, let's say, say a couple. Okay, let's say a couple's <laughs> married, right? Let's uh-huh. say Iran and the United States were a married couple. Oh my! And God. Um, you know, and uh, uh, the 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 man in the relationship all of a sudden has like a personality change, and he's like, "Hey, I want us to get divorced," and the woman's like. Uh, uh, I, I don't think you should. I, I don't think it's a good idea. And the man's like, well, I'm going to get divorced anyway. He gets divorced. She goes and hooks up with another man. And all of a sudden, he starts calling her a, 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 um, a, a, a dirty sleazebag slut and whore because she's sleeping around with another man. Uh, the reality of the situation is you already divorced her, man. You already left her. So you can't look at who she's getting with and who she's hooking up with when you're out and absent because you already got divorced and this is what the united states is trying to do now they're trying to we're trying to cry foul and saying oh they're enriching uranium so how can we re-enter the deal the way it was no you just re-enter the deal the way it was and they uh, should be expected to reverse to reverse any uh, enriching of uranium that they had done uh, while we were out of the deal so if, if the husband wants to, or the ex-husband now wants to get back with his ex-wife, uh, he can't tell her, oh, you slept with these other men. All he can say is, hey, now if we get back together and we get back married, you can't go sleeping with other men. And that's just natural. Yeah, okay, well, obviously when we get married, I won't go sleeping with other men, she will tell <laughs> him. And that, that would be a reasonable conclusion, right? Right. So... Um, the United States should just re-enter this deal in a reasonable fashion. And uh, th- this is how it's going to be because, look, we have a very sh- narrow, narrow, narrow parochial window to re-enter this deal. Yep. Very short time period. Iran's general elections are coming up very soon. And uh, in Iran, the people are going through lots of struggles. The economy of Iran has been crushed by Trump's maximum pressure sanctions campaign. Um, uh, The Iranian people are being hurt by the coronavirus COVID-19 pandemic and lack of access to uh, healthcare means and medicine and so on. 
So, of course, the hardliners are going to come in and say, well, it was Hassan Rouhani's fault for entering this deal with the devil back uh, under the Obama administration. Vote us in, and we're going to show the devil who the real Iranians are and who the real Persian fighters are. And uh, they will reinvigorate a, a nationalistic pride. They will reinvigorate a Persian history, um, uh, Persian history uh, uh, identity value system. They will reinvigorate nationalism. And the hardliners with their emboldened path will win the uh, general elections that are upcoming. Uh, the, the new president will be a hardliner most likely. And there won't be no Iran deal for the United States to enter. And that, that's a world we don't want to envision because that can lead to potentially another conflict or another war. And this time it will be a war with Iran. Right. And I mean, Trump wanted that, which is why he bombed for Qasem Soleimani. Qasem, Qasem Soleimani. But again, as Kyle Kalinske said, he, they would be crazy to get back in the deal. I think he's, he said, I think it would be crazy. They would be crazy too. But again, Hassan Rouhani wants to do it for the economic reasons. So, and and, and yeah, Hassan Rouhani wants to do it for the economic reasons. And the reality of the situation is it's a deal that happened under his presidency. So he would not want his legacy, his presidential legacy to be the one deal he did make, the one diplomatic success he did have ultimately failed. So, you know, for his legacy's sake, if we want to go solely on legacy and solely on personality type, uh, it's of great benefit to Hassan Rouhani uh, that uh, this deal is reinstated because uh, it will just mean that he had a diplomatic success. So exactly. <laughs> it happened yeah. under him and it should end under him as well. Um, but I do think the trust in the United States, not just in Iran, but around the world has been killed because what we ultimately said uh, when Trump backed out of the JCPOA, out of the Iran nuclear deal, what, the what message the United States sent to the world community, to the global community is, hey, you cannot trust us on any diplomatic deals. A new president can come in and throw that deal right out. How is anyone ever going to trust us with diplomacy from right. now on? And you can't trust the democratic corporate fucking hack stupid ass tool like and shill like Joe Biden, who is not thinking with his freaking head. Not thinking with his head. So he just wants another opportunity at war for another yep. opportunity at a cash flood, a cash infusion for the de defense contractors and the yep. military industrial complex. I wonder where that dark money's coming from. And speaking of dark money, I, I just wanted to kind of uh, ask you, because Joe Biden's a bit stressful covering him. Um, you know, in Joe Biden's administration, we now have uh, AOC v. Ted Cruz. You heard of this going on. Uh, yes. Right? And yes. I covered on, I gave like about a nine minute, 10 minute summary to my viewers about what's going on with GameStop and the stock and what short selling is and how it works. Um, I, I kind of give them that. Give us your summary of what happened. What the hell happened on Wall Street this week? Okay, so there's a lot of a backstory, obviously. Um, GameStop was a company whose stock wasn't performing well this time last year. Uh, and they just did not have the best fundamentals. However, there were a few financial experts and a few uh, uh, 